Our ancient ancestors were no less inventive and resourceful than we are today. They worked with different technologies and according to different beliefs, but some of the things they created were astonishing. In fact, they were so astonishing that we're still mystified by some of them today, as you're about to see in this video. During a drought in 2014, Poyang Lake in the central Chinese province of Jiangxi dried up for the first time in centuries. When it did, it revealed the presence of a granite footbridge that nobody even knew was there. The granite footbridge is thought to have been built during the country's Ming Dynasty era nearly 400 years ago. That makes its length all the more impressive. With a length of 2,930 meters or 1.8 miles, if you prefer to measure things that way, this is the longest lake bridge in China. Historians and archaeologists in the country have nicknamed it the Thousand Eye Bridge because of the 1,100 holes along its length. Records suggest that it was built by the order of the Changzhen Emperor in 1631, but that hasn't been conclusively proven. One possible explanation for the fact that the enormous bridge went on to be forgotten by history is that the lake is thought to be haunted. It's often compared to the Bermuda Triangle because of the sheer volume of ships that have vanished in its waters. Perhaps the bridge became part of the myth, and the people of the time decided it was better to drown it and forget about it. In a discovery that's flushing out new insights into ancient life, Archaeologists in Jerusalem have unearthed a 2,700-year-old private toilet. This limestone fixture found ahead of construction in the Armen Hanatsev neighborhood is a rare luxury from the 7th century BCE. The toilet cubicle carved out of limestone bedrock measures about 5 by 6.5 feet and was found alongside 30 to 40 bowls, which may have held aromatic oils or incense to freshen the air. The toilet was discovered in the ruins of an ancient palace, which also featured an ancient garden with orchids and aquatic plants. The palace, which offered a view over the Temple Mount, may have been the residence of a king of Judah. The discovery of this private toilet cubicle provides a unique glimpse into the lives of the wealthy in ancient Jerusalem, reminding us that even the most mundane aspects of daily life can offer valuable historical insights. It's also a reminder that some aspects of our daily lives that we've come to take for granted have been around for thousands of years, even if they used to be reserved for the elite, like this toilet. We're moving on to an artifact that was discovered in a Warring States-era mausoleum tomb in China in 1990. Crystal glass is commonly used in drinking glasses and tableware today, but until the Warring States crystal glass was discovered, we had no idea that the technology behind the glass was available to the elite members of Chinese society 2,200 years ago. The glass looks just like a modern drinking glass and is in astonishingly good condition for its age. It's 6 inches tall with a round opening at the top and it's made from all-natural high-quality crystal. It's considered so important in China that it's listed as one of only 64 ancient artifacts that are never allowed to leave the country. This precious item was found in Hangzhou, Zhejiang province, about two feet below the ground, within the tomb of an unknown individual. It's the only glass of its kind from this period ever to be found in China, but glass breaks so easily that it's probably not a surprise that we haven't found any more examples yet. The real question is how was it made? And it's one that modern-day experts haven't answered yet. The people of Ethiopia are very proud of the obelisk of Aksum. They have every right to be, considering it took 70 years to persuade the city of Rome to hand the enormous steel back to them. We can see why it took so long, though. The sheer size of the steel makes the fact that the whole thing is moved between continents and across seas twice within a century utterly incredible. The steel is a relic of the Kingdom of Aksum, which was a global superpower that lasted from 400 BC until the 10th century. For most of that time, it was a pagan nation and erected huge pillars in honor of its leaders when they passed away. This ended during the 4th century when Aksum turned to Christianity. 
It's believed that the obelisk of Axum was built shortly before this time. It remained standing until the 16th century when it was felled by an earthquake and left to sink into the sand. By the time Italian soldiers found the broken pieces of it during their conquest of Ethiopia in 1935, it had been forgotten about. They took it back to Rome with them and reassembled it as a symbol of their victory. But the United Nations ordered them to hand it back after the Second World War. It took them until 2007 to comply. Better late than never. How could a 15th century Italian soldier do battle at night if it was too dark to see his opponent? Did he go to bed and wait until morning? No, he used a lantern shield. The curious shields featured a small hole at the top into which a lantern could be fitted, accompanied by a second compartment for oil. That way, a soldier could keep fighting all the way through the night until the sun came up. An alternative theory is that the lantern was supposed to be an offensive weapon designed to blind an opponent. Historians differ in opinion about whether the devices were genuinely used in combat or whether they were only used by the ancient equivalent of police officers patrolling the streets of Italian cities at night. In any event, they were probably more trouble than they were worth. It would have been easy for the oil to leak out across the shield, setting the arm of the wearer on fire and leaving him at a significant disadvantage. It might not be a perfect invention, but it's extremely forward-thinking for its era. When the Romanian inventor Vassal Carpin created a battery in the 1950s, nobody really cared. After all, a battery's a battery, and they're ten a penny. Scientists would pay a lot more than a penny today to find out how Carpin's battery works. The inventor's creation is now known as Carpin's Pile and has been working continuously for almost 70 years. Some people have described it as a perpetual motion machine. Scientists disagree with that assessment, stating that such a device couldn't exist because it would break the second law of thermodynamics. It's been speculated that the fact that the battery's electrodes are made of pure gold and platinum might have something to do with its longevity, but that hasn't been proven. The battery holds a charge of just one volt, so it wouldn't be enough to power anything significant, but imagine the potential for the future of batteries if the secret of this one could be understood. It could become the template for a whole new generation of batteries that never have to be replaced. Your phone would never run out of charge again. The question of what the people who lived in the Middle East thousands of years ago thought they were doing when they created the Nimrod lens is unlikely ever to be resolved. The object, also known as the layered lens, has the exact same magnification properties as the first telescope. The difference is that the telescope was an invention of the early 17th century. The Nimrod lens is more like 3,000 years old. Its discovery in the ruins of an ancient Assyrian palace in Iraq in 1850 suggests that it once belonged to someone with great wealth and power, but we have no idea what they might have used it for. We can make a few guesses, though. It might have been a burning lens used to start fires by focusing the rays of the sun. It might also have been a magnifying glass, which would have been centuries before its time if it was a deliberate invention. Whatever it is, it was built to last. Fashioning a lens like this out of rock crystal made it robust enough to stand the passage of time, so people will still probably be studying it and trying to work out why it was created another 3,000 years from now. Warden Cliff Tower, also known as the Tesla Tower, is a fascinating tale of ambition, innovation, and ultimately disappointment. Constructed in 1901 to 1902 on Long Island, New York, this early experimental wireless transmission station was the brainchild of the brilliant inventor Nikola Tesla. Tesla envisioned the tower as a means to transmit messages, telephony, and even facsimile images across the Atlantic Ocean to England and to ships at sea. However, his grand plans were met with financial hurdles and skepticism from investors, including financier J.P. Morgan. Despite Tesla's relentless efforts, the project was abandoned in 1906 and never became operational. 
The tower was demolished for scrap in 1907, and the property was foreclosed in 1922. The site has since changed hands multiple times and was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2018. Today, it stands as a testament to Tesla's audacious vision of a world connected by wireless technology, a dream that has largely been realized, albeit not in the way Tesla had originally imagined. Oh, and before anyone points it out, we know this isn't technically ancient, but it's over a century old and it's still fascinating. When it comes to telling the time, the most popular way of doing so in China and India prior to the invention of the modern-day clock was the incense clock. There's a lot of disagreement between experts about who invented the incense clock and when. We know that it was popular in China by the time of the Song Dynasty in the 10th century and spread from China to Korea and Japan. But the history of the device can be traced back to the 8th century in India. Some sources indicate that the Indians actually got the idea from Chinese inventors who came up with the first incense clock in the 6th century. But the reliability of those sources is where the debate comes in. In basic terms, each incense clock holds either an incense stick or incense powder that's been carefully manufactured to burn at a very specific speed. As such, it's possible to work out what day it is or how much time has passed by checking how much of the stick or the powder inside the clock is burned. More advanced models contain gongs and bells which would automatically ring to indicate the passing of an hour or a day. Nero is remembered by history as ancient Rome's most indolent emperor. He was a man who preferred indulging in personal comforts to running his empire. Those comforts were often outrageously hedonistic, but there was no indulgence Nero loved more than his prized bathtub. The bathtub of Nero is truly a creation of decadence, crafted from imperial porphyry. The type of marble used in the construction of the bathtub was rare and highly prized at the time he had it made in the mid-first century as it came from only one mine in Egypt and was supremely difficult to cut break, or otherwise beat into shape. Those facts only make it all the more amazing that Nero's workers were able to not only shape the materials, but to create a perfectly smooth, polished bathtub 25 feet in diameter so the charismatic but politically useless emperor could bathe in comfort. Nero's bathtub is such an opulent artifact that it's now contained within the Vatican Museums. That seems to be a fitting place for it but we suspect that not even the Pope himself is allowed to bathe in it. Here in the 2020s, we still don't have a totally accurate method of predicting earthquakes. It's a problem that the human race has been wrestling with for thousands of years, but the first known attempt to build an earthquake detector happened in China in the year 132. This is the seismograph designed by Zhang Heng, and it's incredibly sophisticated for a product of that era. Zhang's device works by placing it on the ground where it's sensitive enough to detect tremors from long distances. When tremors are detected, a pendulum within the seismograph swings. Should the swing become strong enough, it will dislodge a ball from the mouth of one of the ornate dragons on the side of the device, which then drops into the waiting mouth of one of the equally ornate frogs. This not only indicates the approach of the earthquake, but also gives the observer a rough idea of which direction the earthquake is happening in. We can't decide whether to be impressed that Zhang Heng was so far ahead of his time, or embarrassed that we haven't come up with a much better way of predicting earthquakes all these years later. Tattoos are more fashionable in most parts of the world now than they've been in decades. But we're not sure that would be the case if people still had to get their tattoos via the method that was used in North America 2,000 years ago. This spiky device, which is in storage at Washington State University, was probably a painful thing to have applied to your skin. It's made of pear cactus spines tied to a wooden handle and wrapped in yucca leaf, and it was used to tattoo the Pueblo people who once lived in what's now the southeast of Utah. 
What's curious is that no evidence of tattooing has ever been found on the skin or bones of any ancient Pueblo bodies located so far, and nor is there any mention of tattooing in the few written or drawn records we have of their culture. We do know the ancient people of North America had tattoos, though, because of other cactus-based tools found in places like New Mexico and Arizona. In those cases, though, the tools were made over 1,000 years after this one. We wonder if people were getting tattoos of stars, roses, skulls, and Chinese symbols even back then. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you'll be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching.